today I'm going to break down the federal court decision on January 23rd, 2024, declaring the Canadian federal government's proclamation of a state of emergency in February 2022. That was during the trucker protests, as they call it, and uh, the associated regulations and order that these were all illegal, both outside the scope of the Emergency Act and a breach in some respects of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is basically the Canadian equivalent of the Bill of Rights. Frankly, those who have been trying to fight the mandates in the courts and the various suspensions of civil liberties and breaches of so-called fundamental rights in the courts since 2020 must have been having a really bad time of it to think this is a great decision. Sure, it's okay. One judge of the federal court gave them several of the orders they were seeking. But read the whole judgment, folks. The judge basically provides the government with his advice as to ways to amend the Emergency Act to increase its scope so that next time there will be no issue as to the legality of emergency measures. That is not a good thing. I would be very surprised if his decision doesn't provide the state with the moral grounds to make those amendments, expanding emergency powers, which would otherwise have been very hard to do. As for freezing of bank accounts, what the RCMP and banks did this time was so ridiculously brazen, the justice literally had no choice but to declare these to be unreasonable searches and seizures. I suspect it won't take much, legislatively, to add some kind of objective minimum standard to determine whether someone should be the target of the seizures and allow the targets to question it and thus legalize the process. The other issue is the appeal. Almost certainly it will be appealed. Judges control the narrative by what they declare the facts to be in their reasons and what evidence they leave out. I don't have all the evidence that was before the judge, so maybe it's the fault of the applicants. But what we have in this decision is a narrative which is remarkably one-sided, pro-government in my view, consistent with the view of things of people who opposed the protest. The decision paints a picture that is very different from the way the protesters and their supporters would describe the sequence of events. This is important, as the declared story is one that an appellate court, less inclined to fuss about the strict language of the Emergency Act, can seize upon to overturn the decision that there was no national emergency, for example. We will see. Let me go through the decision in a bit more detail than you may have heard on MSM or True North. First, who is Justice Richard Mosley? He is actually the go-to judge on the federal court for national security interests and has heard a number of Canadian anti-terrorist cases, including Omar Cotter. You might want to look up that decision. Next, we have the applicants. In our system, these are the people and the organizations who were applying to challenge the use of the emergency power. First comment from me is, uh, were these really the best applicants we could come up with? There is Kristen Nagel and Canadian Frontline Nurses. Justice Mosley really didn't like Nagel or the CFN, which is run by Nagel, apparently. He eventually ruled that although Nagel may have hung out in Ottawa for a while during the protest, she wasn't affected in any meaningful way by the emergency powers. She didn't have her bank account frozen. I have to say, when you consider the behavior of the government in refusing even to talk to the protesters and the smears used against protesters and critiques of the mandates, it is a bit rich to hear the justice say that anyone willing to take on the government demonstrated bad faith, which he does about Nagel at paragraph 183 of the judgment. He concludes at paragraph 187 that Nagel and the CFN contributed, and I quote, nothing of value, close quotes, to the proceeding. That's at paragraph 185. And ruled that she had no standing to even be there. He didn't much like her lawyers either. The justice did the same with a number of other applicants, declaring they had no standing. It is fortunate there were a few left. This was correct at law, I mean the standing decision, in that you have to show in our system some kind of real material interest in the case, which again is why I ask, how did opposition to the emergency powers and the mandates and other government lockdown measures generate such mediocre applicants for the most part? Fortunately, other applicants such as Edward Cornell and Vincent Gerksis, 
if I'm pronouncing that right, did actually have their bank accounts frozen. The justice agreed they had standing. Another form of standing is public interest standing. Two of the applicants, the Canadian Constitution Foundation and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, make it their business to get involved in this type of public law fight to support individuals who may not have the means to press their constitutional cases. They were granted public interest standing by Justice Mosley, which is a very good thing since their more substantive arguments, he notes in his decision, are probably why he made the ruling he did. The first big issue the court had to deal with was the Attorney General of Canada's argument that the case was moot. Moot basically means the case should be dismissed as there is no longer anything to fight about. This argument has succeeded in other cases challenging the mandates after they had been revoked. In my view, the mootness argument in both the case of the mandates and the imposition of the emergency powers is a bit rich. It amounts to arguing, we broke the law, we froze your bank accounts, we prevented you from getting on an airplane, but the emergency's over. You can get on a plane now. Too bad you missed your mom's funeral. Tough luck. So there's nothing anymore to fight about, right? Obviously, to anyone with a functioning brain, if this argument were allowed to succeed, a tyrannical government would simply revoke its tyrannical laws every time anyone challenged them. Then when the lawsuit was dismissed, it could reintroduce the laws and force the litigants to start the lawsuits again. The justice dealt with this at paragraph 149. He wrote, If the court declines to hear these cases, the precedent may be established that so long as the government can revoke the declaration of an emergency before a judicial review application can be heard, the courts will have no role in reviewing the legality of such a decision. Justice Mosley distinguished the challenges to the mandates, which were declared moot by other courts, because there were actually decisions out there upholding the constitutionality of the mandates. So there really wasn't a need, in his view, for that issue to come back before the court. However, there hadn't been a decision yet on the use of the emergency power. The public inquiry and the special joint committee of the House of Commons and Senate were no substitutes for a court decision. He would hear the arguments. Another reason the justice gave for hearing the case it's one of those examples of the narrative that reflects very poorly on the protesters. I'm just going to read from paragraph 142 of the judgment. Under the judicial economy analysis, courts can consider whether the matter is likely to recur and is evasive of review, and whether the matter is of national or public importance. The respondent does not dispute that the matter is of national and public importance but contends that alone is insufficient in the absence of an additional social cost in leaving the matter undecided. The respondent suggests that the likelihood of recurrence is uncertain, given the exceptional circumstances in which the act was invoked, and contended that further declarations will not be evasive of review going forward in light of the requirements for both a public inquiry and parliamentary review. I disagree. The risk of other episodes of public disorder of the nature which occurred in February 2022 cannot be discounted. While the circumstances were exceptional up to that point in time, there can be no guarantee that there will not be a recurrence of similar events or worse. In light of the rise of extremist elements within our society, prepared to take their opposition to government policies to another level of protest, and to whip up support for such protests through the extraordinary reach of social media. That is not a good way to describe the protests. There's nothing, of course, here about why the protests occurred. He never so much as even contemplates that the protests had merit, or may have had merit. If anything, he suggests the opposite, and that there was indeed a link between the protests and, I quote, extremist elements within our society, close quotes. Expect to hear that line repeated in the appeal decision, and it's certainly going to be repeated in MSM. The narrative the Court of Appeal is going to be able to rely on is important to highlight. I am going to read some of this at length because it's important to hear how Justice Mosley describes the sequence of events. And ask yourself as I'm reading this, is that how you experienced the events leading up to the emergency? Paragraph 31. On November 19, 2021, the Public Health Agency of Canada announced that, as of January 15, 2022, certain groups of foreign nationals who were up to that point exempt from vaccine requirements for entry to Canada would now be required to be fully vaccinated, including essential service providers such as truck drivers. Similar measures were put in place by the United States government at the border with Canada. 
On January 13, 2022, the Minister of Health clarified that an unvaccinated Canadian truck driver could not be denied entry into Canada, but would need to meet requirements for pre-entry arrival and day eight testing as well as quarantine requirements. Lovely. Paragraph 33. As a result of those travel restrictions, a group of individuals prepared to drive across Canada protest in Ottawa under the name, in quotes, Freedom Convoy 2022, close quotes. On January 28, 2022, the convoy arrived in Ottawa. At this point, it consisted of hundreds of vehicles of various types, including tractor-trailer units and thousands of individuals who intended to protest Canada's public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the new vaccination requirements for cross-border truckers. The protesters and vehicles occupied much of the downtown core of Ottawa, including streets in the vicinity of the parliamentary precinct, the Supreme Court of Canada, and the federal courts. Among other things, the effect was to block vehicular traffic and pedestrian access to offices, businesses, churches, and residences in the affected area. Over the next few days, the protests became a blockade of downtown government business and residential districts accompanied by incessant noise from truck horns, train-type whistles, late-night street parties, fireworks, and constant megaphone-amplified haulers of freedom, in quotes. Fumes from the exhausts of diesel and gasoline engines permeated the air and seeped into neighboring premises. Containers of fuel were being brought in constantly to keep the vehicles running and to provide heat. There were reported incidents of harassment, minor assaults, and intimidation. This created intolerable conditions for many residents and workers in the district. Between January 30th and February 2nd, 2022, the demonstrators began to erect structures and organize for a prolonged occupation of the core national capital. It sounds like barricades, minefields, and barbed wire. Maybe pillboxes. The Ottawa Police Service, OPS, appeared to be unable to cope with the situation. That is important when you look at the, the legislation and regulations later on, and I'm thinking of the appeal. The Ottawa Police Service appeared to be unable to cope with the situation. The OPS chief declared there may not be a policing solution and there need to be other elements brought in to find a safe, swift, and sustainable end to this demonstration that's happening here and across the country. Between February 8th and February 10th, 2022, the convoy numbered approximately 418 vehicles and additional cars and trucks were arriving with protesters. Children were estimated to be present in 25% of the vehicles. Now, what is he suggesting there? A counter-protest on February 13, 2022 saw hundreds of residents on suburban streets blocking access to vehicles headed to downtown Ottawa. Convoy participants or their supporters allegedly engaged in a concerted effort to flood Ottawa's emergency services with calls designed to overwhelm the services' capacity to respond. Donations to fund the protest were received by, crowd, by a crowdfunding site Give, Send, Go. Information subsequently released indicated that 55.7% of the funds received, totaling 3.6 million USD, were made by U.S.-based donors. And that certainly suggests this is a foreign-funded operation, not domestic at all. Information considered by the IRG, according to its minutes, included that extremist elements were taking part in the protest. These included members of an organization known as Diagalon, which reportedly proposed to establish a diagonal country from Alaska to Florida under the slogan, Gun or Rope. The founder, Jeremy McKenzie, was arrested in January 2022 before coming to protest in Ottawa after police found firearms, prohibited magazines, ammunition, and body armor at his home. Moreover, one of McKenzie's associates, Derek Harrison, had made a video in which he reportedly expressed his desire to turn the Freedom Convoy protest into our own January 6th event. You see very much the MAGA Trump terror kind of permeates the decision. The purpose of referring to this is not to indicate whether the concerns about Diagalon or the charges against McKenzie were well-founded, but it is information that was before Cabinet when the decision to invoke the AA was made. Again, that will be referred to on appeal. Visible symbols of hate were seen to be held or worn by protesters in media photographs of the occupation. Applicants, Mr. Jost and Ms. Nagel, acknowledged under cross-examination having seen demonstrators wearing yellow Star of David emblems. Is that a symbol of hate? Featuring the words non-vax, news articles reported protesters with flags featuring swastikas. 
were there more than one swastika? And signs bearing the Nazi SS symbol, as well as Confederate flags. This is a very one-sided and rather dated view of events and some of the facts. Diagalon, I've heard, was a joke. And that was even something that was heard by the public inquiry. Um, did the applicants even bother to put that into evidence? Was that outside the Overton window, the judicial Overton window, that this judge was willing to hear? But at any rate, Diagonalon is left there as some terrifying threat to the country. I have to say I have a certain distrust for lawyers and even alternative media like True North who remain too trusting of the system and seem to think it just needs a little tweaking. Is that why counter-narrative facts don't seem to be included in the decision, that they were just not put to the judge at all? They were not put into evidence. The, the record that the government put into evidence was left there unchallenged. What we have then is a government narrative about hate and the symbols of hate, which basically closed the case in the minds of most mainstream media viewers about the protests to this day. All right, let me continue with the narrative, and this is important. Paragraph 51. Early on February 14, 2022, RCMP officers executed a warrant issued under the criminal code and raided two camper trailers and a mobile home at Coots, arrested 11 individuals, and seized a cache of weapons, including 14 firearms, a large supply of ammunition, and body armor. Four individuals were charged with conspiracy to commit murder and other offenses. Some of the body armor seized was marked with the Diagonal insignia. So there we go, we have Diagalon again. As it turns out, this is the only evidence of violent extremism the court heard about, the case of the Coots 4, which has still not been tried, and we know very little about the evidence supporting those charges in this decision. Although the choice of language is interesting, for example, the use of cache of weapons. One wonders how the Coots 4, uh, who are still in remand, will feel when reading this judgment, which refers to them having a cache of weapons and uh, elsewhere in the judgment to being a hardened cell. Okay, on February 14, 2022, the Governor and Council, GIC, declared a public order emergency under the Emergencies Act, the proclamation to end the disruptions and blockades occurring across the country. There were an estimated 500 trucks and other vehicles remaining in downtown Ottawa at the time. Between February 15th and February 23rd, 2022, RCMP disclosed information from the OPP, OPS, and its own investigations on approximately 57 named entities and individuals to financial service providers, resulting in the temporary freezing of about 257 accounts under the economic order. On February 23rd, 2022, the declaration of a public order emergency was revoked. Now, it's important to note here the, the narrative recognized by the court is of an escalation of a blockade of hardship on citizens and on an impact to the economy such as blocked border crossings. There's no weight given at all to an another narrative that emergency measures were in fact proclaimed for completely other political reasons. That narrative is not on the record. For example, the government really didn't care much about the economy or diesel fumes in Ottawa. What it cared about is shutting down political dissent, and we'll get to that. That narrative is not in the decision, and that's important. The narrative also clearly suggests an escalation, hardship, economic hardship, leading to the finding of the cache of weapons and the hardened cell, and then the declaration of emergency is declared on that day. That is very much a pro-government narrative. It suggests the government literally was forced to declare the emergency when the hardened cell was discovered, and that is definitely a throwback to the FLQ crisis, that language. Okay, what's not there in the narrative? How about the fact the government refused to so much as talk to the protesters? What role did that play? The government's own arrogance and intransigence in the length and nature of the protest. What happened to Audi Alterum Partum, hearing both sides in our political system, if you are creating the problem, putting gas on the fire, isn't that an important consideration in whether the emergency declaration was justified? Okay, now I'm going to get to the reasons themselves. All right, next is what was the court asked to decide? This is dealt with at 202. 
Justice Mosley writes, the question for the court is whether the governor and council, acting on the recommendation of cabinet, reasonably formed the belief that reasonable grounds existed to declare a public order emergency under Section 17 of the Act, as defined in the jurisprudence. The reasonable grounds to believe evidentiary standard requires more than mere suspicion and less than proof on the balance of probabilities. Whether cabinet had sufficient evidence to satisfy the standard when the decision was made to invoke the act is a key issue in these proceedings. All right, so let's look at how the court dealt with the issue of whether there was, in fact, a national emergency. Turning to paragraph 242, it is not disputed that the discoveries of weapons, ammunition, and other materials at Coots was deeply troubling and greatly influenced the cabinet in recommending the invocation of the act, as did the possibility that similar findings would emerge at any of the other blockades across the country. While the widely published images of people enjoying the hot tub and bouncy castle set up in proximity to Parliament Hill and the War Memorial suggests a benign intent, there were undoubtedly others present there and elsewhere at the blockades across the country with a darker purpose. Again, you see this narrative that the use of the emergency power was solely to deal with a physical problem, obstruction of a city, the functioning of a city and economic issues, and that there were indeed signs of people out there with a darker purpose. Justice Mosley continues at paragraph 252, the potential for an increase in the level of unrest and violence that would further threaten the safety and security of Canadians is addressed at some length in the section 58 explanation. The document contends that, in quotes, the Freedom Convoy could also lead to an increase of individuals who support ideologically motivated violent extremism and the prospect for serious violence. The explanation notes that since the convoy began, that there had been a significant increase in the number and duration of incidents involving threats of violence assessed to be politically or ideologically motivated. It asserts that the OPS had been unable to enforce the rule of law in the downtown core due to the overwhelming volume of protesters. That is a debatable conclusion, as there appear to have been more compelling reasons for the failure of the OPS to prevent the occupation of the city, such as a failure of leadership and determination, together with a mistaken assumption that the protest would be short-lived. So there's a bit of a shot at the OPS. Due to its nature and to the broad powers it grants the federal executive, the Emergencies Act is a tool of last resort. The GIC cannot invoke the Emergencies Act because it is convenient or because it may work better than other tools at their disposal or available to the provinces. This does not mean that every tool has to be used and tried to determine that the situation exceeded the capacity or authority of the provinces. And in this instance, the evidence is clear that the majority of the provinces were able to deal with the situation using other federal law, such as the criminal code and their own legislation. The Section 58 explanation concludes that the ongoing protests had created a critical, urgent, temporary situation that is national in scope and cannot effectively be dealt with under any other law in Canada. While I agree that the evidence supports the conclusion that the situation was critical and required an urgent resolution by governments, the evidence, in my view, does not support the conclusion that it could not have been effectively dealt with under other laws of Canada, as it was in Alberta, or that it exceeded the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it. That was demonstrated not to be the case in Quebec and other provinces and territories, including Ontario, except in Ottawa. For these reasons, I conclude that there was no national emergency justifying the invocation of the Emergencies Act, and the decision to do so was therefore unreasonable and ultra vires. So that's his ruling on whether there was an emergency, found that there wasn't. But you can see from the narrative itself, the Court of Appeal is going to be scratching its head a little bit about that. The way he has described the impact of the arrests at Coots, the way he's described the Ottawa police being unable to handle it, I'm not so sure that's going to hold up. He actually does contemplate in the decision that he might be overturned on this point of a national emergency. So he deals with the next issue, which is the threshold requirement that for a public order emergency to, to be declared, it must meet the definition set out in Section 16 of the Act. And that requires an answer to the question, was the threats to the security of Canada threshold met? In a general sense, he writes, it was reasonable for the GIC to be alarmed at the impact of the blockades and the effects 
they were having on cross-border trade. Those effects could be said to fall within a broader sense of threats to the security of Canada, or more generally the concept of national security. A broad and flexible interpretation of the words threats to the security of Canada could encompass the concerns which led the GIC to issue the Public Order Emergency Declaration. Had the meaning of those words not been limited by reference to another statute and applying a deferential standard of review, I would have found that the threshold was satisfied. However, the words threats to the security of Canada do not stand alone in the Act and must be interpreted with reference to the meaning of that term as it is defined in Section 2 of the CSIS Act and incorporated in Section 16 of the EA. Threats to the security of Canada in Section 2 of the CSIS Act refers to four types of activities. Only one of the four is relevant to these proceedings. Under paragraph 2C, threats to the security of Canada means activities within or relating to Canada directed toward or in support of the threat or use of acts of serious violence against persons or property for the purpose of achieving a political, religious, or ideological objective within Canada or a foreign state. The definition excludes lawful advocacy, protest, or dissent, unless carried on in conjunction with any of the activities referred to in the four paragraphs, including C. All right, did you hear that? The court ruled, Justice Mosley ruled, that the words threats to the security of Canada given their ordinary meeting, would have applied to the use of the emergency power in this case, were it not for the incorporation into the legislation of a definition from the CSIS Act, which has a different purpose. That's the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. This is one of the main reasons this is not a great decision. Although a victory, the victory was a technical one. The judge was very much inclined to rule in the government's favor. All right, the judge goes on. There is no dispute that the activities in question in these proceedings were carried out for the purpose of achieving a political or ideological objective within Canada. The participants in the protests in Ottawa and elsewhere were explicit in demanding changes to government policy. Some of the participants went further in demanding a change in government. The question is whether the activities were directed towards or in support of the threat or use of acts of serious violence as the definition requires. The applicants contend that the record does not show that there was compelling and credible information before the GIC that there were reasonable grounds to believe in the existence of threats to the security of Canada, as defined by the CSIS Act when the decision was made to issue the proclamation. In fact, they submit Cabinet was presented with evidence to the contrary. The director of CSIS confirmed in his advice to Cabinet that the service did not assess that the protests constituted a threat to the security of Canada. Serious violence to property could encompass the several offenses in the code relating to destruction or damage to property, including critical infrastructure, which are punishable on indictment. In particular, destruction or damage to critical infrastructure could amount to serious violence to property should it take down systems such as the electrical grid or natural gas supply required to heat homes and run industries across the country. Absent any authority in support of the proposition, I am unable to find that the term encompasses the type of economic disruption that resulted from the border crossing blockades, troubling as they were. It may be that Parliament will wish to revisit the question of whether the CSIS Act definition which serves the several purposes of that statute, adequately covers the different harms that may result from an emergency situation when they may fall short of serious violence to property. This court can only apply the law as it finds it. It has no discretion to do otherwise. Directly or by implication, this decision is telling the government to tighten up the legislation so that this type of protest can be crushed next time. Again, that again is not a good thing. He says this fairly explicitly uh, later in the judgment. When Bill C-77 to enact the EA was being considered, the CSIS Act definition had the virtue of having been recently considered and adopted by Parliament and was dropped into the draft legislation to respond to concerns that its scope was otherwise too broad and would capture minor threats or use of violence. 
The effect was to raise the level of the test to be met by the GIC before a public order emergency could be declared. The GIC had to have reasonable grounds to believe that the threats to the security of Canada described in Section 2 of the CESIS Act existed. This court may share the views of those who think that a definition designed to constrain the investigative actions of the security service is ill-suited to serve as a threshold for the invocation of emergency powers by the GIC, particularly when there may be other valid reasons for declaring an emergency, such as those set out in the proclamation and Section 58 explanation. But the court cannot rewrite the statute and has to take the definition as it reads. The clerk had cautioned the Prime Minister that PCO's conclusion that the criteria for declaring a public order emergency had been met was vulnerable to challenge. Properly so, in my view, as the evidence in support of PCO's analysis was not abundant. It rested primarily on what was uncovered at Coots, Alberta, when the RCMP executed search warrants and discovered firearms, ammunition, and the indicia of right-wing extremist elements. I'm assuming the indicia of right-wing extremist elements is, uh, is Diagolon. The potential for serious violence, or being unable to say that there was no potential for serious violence, was of course a valid reason for concern. But in my view, it did not satisfy the tests required to invoke the act, particularly as there was no evidence of a similar hardened cell elsewhere in the country, only speculation and the situation at Coots have been resolved without violence. So basically here, the Coots 4 are described as a hardened cell, which again, probably will not thrill them. This is not to say that the other grounds for invoking the act specified in the proclamation were not valid concerns. Indeed, in my view, they would have been sufficient to meet a test of threats to the security of Canada had those words remained undefined in the statute. As discussed, the words are capable of a broad and flexible interpretation that may have encompassed the type of harms caused to Canada by the actions of the blockaders. But the test for declaring a public order emergency under the EA requires that each element be satisfied, including the definition imported from the CESIS Act. The harm being caused to Canada's economy, trade and commerce was very real and concerning, but it did not constitute threats or the use of serious violence to persons or property. For these reasons, I am also satisfied that the GIC did not have reasonable grounds to believe that a threat to national security existed within the meaning of the act, and the decision was ultra vires. All right, I just want to deal quickly with um, some facts that I don't think were argued. They may be outside the Overton window of what our courts are willing to hear, but it may go to an important issue, which is the government's good faith. And in our system of judging, the type of arguments I'm going to suggest could be made may well be outside the Overton window, and the judge may not have wanted to hear it. But here's the emergency measures regulations, and I'm looking at government good faith, right? And if you look at critical infrastructure as is defined here, and let's look specifically at B, what is critical infrastructure? Infrastructure for the supply of utilities such as water, gas, sanitation, and telecommunications. I don't know. I don't think pipelines are included in that. And that's kind of odd. Why would pipelines not be included in critical infrastructure? Well, you might want to think of pipeline protests and the government's position on that. But let's go to something else. The prohibition section. This is the heart and soul of the regulation. This is the uh, bite. A person must not participate in a public assembly that may reasonably be expected to lead to a breach of the peace by the serious disruption of the movement of persons or goods or the serious interference with trade, the interference with the functioning of critical infrastructure, or the support of the threat or use of acts of seditious violence against persons or property. But then, look down here. Why would anyone be exempted from this? I mean, is, is the fact anyone does this kind of thing, is, isn't that sufficient? Why would anyone be exempt? And yet there is an exemption. If you look down here, you see section 3.1, a foreign national must not enter Canada with the intent to participate in or facilitate an assembly referred to in subsection 2.1. Okay, so that's the, this is the prohibited activity, and yet there's a, an exemption section. Foreign nationals who are Indians under the Indian Act, convention refugees, temporary residents, refugees, and others. Why are these people exempted from committing 
the serious offenses set out in Section 2.1. And then the next question is, why was the emergency, and Justice Mosley notes this in the decision, why was the emergency national in scope? Well, that's, I'll suggest to you that one of the reasons there are exemptions and one of the reasons the emergency was national in scope was that it had nothing to do with the economy, had nothing to do with disrupting people's lives in Ottawa or elsewhere that the purpose of the Emergency Act was to suppress political opposition. Those in the exempted section here are persons who would not likely to be political problems for the government. So they're exempt, I'll, I'll suggest to you. And one of the reasons you might want the Emergency Act to be national in scope and not focus on Ottawa, for example, is that the attack and the purpose of the Emergency Act was to suppress ideas, was to a suppress political opinion, which is not limited spatially to any particular place. This isn't argued, and it should have been. The final issue I want to deal with are the charter violations that the court um, agreed had occurred. The applicants submit that sections 2, 4, and 5 of the regulations infringe charter section 2B, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. Protests are inherently disruptive and are constitutionally protected political expression that goes to the core of, of the freedom. I agree with the applicants that the scope of the regulations was overbroad insofar as it captured people who simply wanted to join in the protest by standing on Parliament Hill carrying a placard. I'll stop there. Isn't that another reason to, to be concerned that the purpose of the uh, proclamation of the emergency and the emergency regulation was the suppression of ideas. Why were people holding placards included? The court went on on the charter issue. Uh, to the extent that peaceful protesters did not participate in the actions of those disrupting the peace, their freedom of, of expression was infringed. The next charter violation it found was in relation to search and seizure. Section 8 of the Constitution. Section 8 provides that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. A reasonable provision authorizing a search must create a system of, one, prior authorization, two, determined by a neutral third party not involved in the investigation, and three, on the standard of reasonable and probable grounds to believe that an offense has been committed and that evidence of the offense will be found in the place subject to the search. Justice Mosley writes, I am satisfied that the disclosure of information about the bank and credit card accounts of the designated persons by the financial institutions to the RCMP constituted a seizure of that information by the government. On the evidentiary record, the names were provided to the financial institutions by the RCMP, and that was considered sufficient to require disclosure to the police. The absence of any objective standard was confirmed by Superintendent Baudouin, who oversaw the implementation of the economic order. He acknowledged in cross-examination that the RCMP did not apply a standard of either reasonable grounds or a standard of reasonable suspicion, and all they required was a bare belief. As I said, I think this is probably easy to fix. In requiring the financial institutions to act on the instructions of the RCMP, in my view, the economic order effectively enlisted them as subordinates of the government and engaged the Charter, Section 8. While the financial institutions were private entities and thus normally beyond the reach of the Charter, the activity in question here can be ascribed to government. The act was truly governmental in nature to implement the temporary measures enacted by the GIC and thus brought the banks and other financial services providers within the scope of Section 8 to the extent of that activity. I find that the failure to require that some objective standard be satisfied before the accounts were frozen breached Section 8. Whether that could be justified in the circumstances depends on a Section 1 analysis. All right, the next thing he deals with is whether the these breaches of the Charter can be justified under Section 1, which allows the government to do things that are reasonable in a democratic society, so to speak. Um, we call it the Oaks Test. The court ruled the political speech is granted the highest level of protection because of its essential role in democratic life. While parked trucks obstructing the roads and blaring horns are not high-value speech, the regulations did not simply prohibit this conduct, which was already illegal under provincial and municipal law, but criminalized the attendance of every single person at those protests 
regardless of their actions. Yeah, hmm, I wonder why. There was no real dispute between the parties that the government had a pressing and substantial objective when they enacted the measures to clear out the blockades that had formed as part of the protest. I agree with the respondent that the objective was pressing and substantial and that there was a rational connection between freezing the accounts and the objective. Hmm, really? Uh, to stop funding the blockades. However, the measures were not minimally impairing. The regulations and economic order fail the minimal impairment tests for two reasons. They were applied throughout Canada, and two, there were less impairing alternatives available. Someone who had nothing to do with the protests could find themselves without the means to access necessaries for household and other family purposes while the accounts were suspended. There appears to have been no effort made to find a solution to that problem while the measures were in effect. Having found that the infringements of Charter Sections 2B and 8 were not minimally impairing, I find that they were not justified under Section 1. Justice Mosley concludes with a rather unusual mea culpa. I don't think I've ever seen this before in a judgment where he basically says, yeah, I really wanted to rule for the government, but darn, I wasn't able to. Uh, here it is. At the outset of these proceedings, while I had not reached a decision on any of the four applications, I was leaning to the view that the decision to invoke the EA was reasonable. I considered the events that occurred in Ottawa and other locations in January and February 2022 went beyond legitimate protest and reflected an unacceptable breakdown of public order. I had and continue to have considerable sympathy for those in government who were confronted with this situation. Had I been at their tables at that time, I may have agreed that it was necessary to invoke the act. And I acknowledge that in conducting judicial review of that decision, I am revisiting that time with the benefit of hindsight and a more extensive record of the facts and law than that which was before the GIC. My preliminary view of the reasonableness of the decision may have prevailed following the hearing due to excellent advocacy on the part of counsel for the attorney general that's the attorney general who argued, argued it was moot but anyway had i not taken the time to carefully deliberate about the evidence and submissions particularly those of the ccla and ccf all right to wrap up as i've tried to illustrate although the applicants were successful the court has provided a narrative that affirms the presence of violent extremists on the fringes of the protests perhaps hiding in their bouncy castles. Uh, there is nothing in the decision to legitimate why the protests occurred or any of the grievances of the protesters. Justice Mosey has held that protests of this kind should be broken up and that targeting such protests is a reasonable use of the emergency power, including the freezing of bank accounts if it's done properly. He was handcuffed, he says, by the incorporation into the Emergency Act of the definition of threat to the security of Canada in the CISA. He basically says this was a mistake and the government should amend the definition so that the next crackdown on protests of government policy like this will be successful and can be upheld by the courts. Another issue that is outside the scope of modern judicial review is evidence of bad faith in the drafting of the legislation. Evidence of bad faith is quite relevant when considering the purpose of the regulation and whether the real concern was violence or the economy or diesel fumes or rather the crushing of political dissent from start to finish. Only the government story really emerges from the narrative of events set out in the decision. There is nothing here to break the government mythology of the lockdowns or the protests held by most and promulgated by MSM. No question there is good here, but also reasons for concern. A lot of reasons for concern.